So, uh, good afternoon. Um, welcome to our talk of Games and Transmedia Projects from Film Academy. Um, we are a course called Interactive Media, and we will present you one by one a few projects which we have worked on the last half year or the last years. Um, so we start, um, this is our project Music City, and I hand over to my dear colleague Christian. Okay, yeah, so um, this is our fourth year project, and um, it's made in one semester, and it's about music and cities. Uh, the team is Moritz Muckler and uh, me and Martin Köge, but he could unfortunately not be here because he is ill. And uh, basically, at first, at the beginning, there was this idea of um, shaping landscapes or cities based on music you are listening to. So what if you could shape the landscape around you so it fits to the music you choose? So, um, f so from that idea, we tried to experiment uh, with audio and um, other procedural generated me uh, meshes, objects, and stuff. And what started as an experiment ended up with a procedural music video, what it is now. And I think we just show some uh, a, a small trailer and. Just don't forget, everything in the trailer is uh, procedural generated, also procedural edited. And uh, yeah, we definitely don't have the rights to the music because it's yeah just pop songs and we put them in. So I think we start. Okay, so at the beginning, you always start with the music analysis. So we uh, just looked at music data and what you can get from it. So here you see a screenshot from Adobe Audition and it does a really nice visualization with the colors. What you see at the top, it's the gain of the music, which um, maybe some of you know. And in the layer below, there is the frequency intensity, so the dynamic of the song. And so we also used all the these parameters to come to our results. We also compared the frequencies with each other so we could uh, have areas where we think the song is similar to other areas in the song, like reference, for example. And we also have the beats. And um, we started always with one object. And like you can see here, the street. And the street is totally. Uh, adapted to the music, so you see what the straight street is uh, without beats. Then we added the beat data, so the car is always moving left and right when the beat uh, appears, and then we added the gain and dynamic to it, so for example, if there's nothing happening in the music, there should also not be any curves, for example. And then uh, with this basic principle, we uh, scaled it up a little bit to whole city structures. And uh, here you can see our generated city on the left. And uh, also the traffic system with all the cars and they stop to the beat of the music. And also the structure is um, getting higher from the city. Uh, when the beat is also more uh, complex and the music is uh, louder, for example. And also uh, with, with this uh, dynamic parameter, so when we analyze the music, uh, we also generate different cityscapes. So we have, for example, if there is a solo song or piano or really calm, um, we have these low dynamic sets of assets uh, when the music is like more like a pop song, it's a little mid dynamic and if it's really hardcore metal or anything else which is really full, um, it's that high dynamic city on the right. And um, yeah, th then we found out one view is a little bit uh, boring and it also does not represent a good flow from the music. So we try to have these three basic uh, views. And uh, the one is to get the viewer into the atmosphere feeling. 
of the music. Uh, then we have one view which is uh, more in the street where we have everything fit to the beat and which is more uh, for the pulse of the music. And then at the end we have the big structure um, also from the city and which could be also referred to structure in music. Then uh, we found out that lots of people don't recognize uh, how uh, how the music really fits to the uh, scenery, so we staged also some. The one you saw, they are all procedurally generated. These are kind of semi-generated, so for example, the houses, they are generated, but what happens in the scene is a little bit staged. So for example, the uh, pool, there are people swimming, and the, uh, so we place them there, and then it's really more clearer for the viewer what uh, fits to the music and what not. And uh, so now we had lots of shots, and they also had to be in kind of an order. So it has to be edited, so, and for that we use kind of a yeah, artificial intelligence who picks through uh, for every music uh, and specific sceneries, and then also edit all the shots to, together. So, for example, you see here some detail shots, and when there is a refrain or a big like bass drop or something, we add it in the uh, to that uh, red uh, frames. Yeah. So then we had these nice systems and everything together, and but we wanted to to test them how fast could we really. Uh, change the settings, how fast, uh, how agile are we really? And so we decided to do another setting and we took Venice because it has a really specific cityscape and there were several new challenges, for example, landmarks like the Marcus Dome uh, or the Opera and other stuff. And so we generated uh, more specific uh, city. So for example, here also in Venedig, really um, interesting DS. This was a little bit difficult because always the city is generated in one frame. So <laughs> it has to be adapted all the time. Then we added the roofs also procedurally. And then we added some assets from Martin um, to get a nice detail. Afterwards, we added the ships with um, a Unity pathfinding thing, and then everything works again to the music. And with this experience, because we did this in five days, so we built the whole setting to a next city in five days, we also thought about uh, we could <laughs> do other cities also, maybe that fast, but let's see. and. Uh, yeah, there could be also Amsterdam, for example, or even Stuttgart, but I think, yeah. <laughs> um, so, and how we did it and how it was managed, uh, we'll tell you now more words. Yeah, because uh, as you can see, uh, just with this uh, small team, we had to build up a, a, an, a kind of engine inside the team who can produce um, as lot of output as possible in a short amount of time because in the beginning um, I still remember that uh, Christian and Matt uh, pitched to me, hey, we want to do music visualization. Uh, can't be that hard, right? Um, but then I asked like, okay, um, how should we do that? And I said, well, we don't know, but we can try. So we said, okay, we want to do that in one semester, not full time, just part time. So um, we will not set up a specific goal where we want to head. We just said, okay, what we can do in that time we have um, and do a kind of research and development. And But how do you do that, like from a production perspective? Well, in the first, you do kind of a swag scheduling. Um, which I said as a stupid wild ass guess. So Interesting, the S. This was a little bit difficult because always the city is generated in one frame, so <laughs> it has to be adapted all the time. Then we added the roofs also procedurally, and then we added some assets from Martin um, to get a nice detail. Afterwards, we added the ships 
with um, a Unity pathfinding thing, and then everything works again to the music. And with this experience, because we did this in five days, so we built the whole setting to a next city in five days, we also thought about uh, we could <laughs> do other cities also, maybe that fast, but let's see. And uh, yeah, there could be also Amsterdam, for example, or even Stuttgart, but I think, yeah. <laughs> um, so, and how we did it and how it was managed, uh, we'll tell you now more words. Yeah, because uh, as you can see, uh, just with this uh, small team, we had to build up a, a, an, a kind of engine inside the team who can produce um, as lot of output as possible in a short amount of time, because in the beginning, um, I still remember that uh, Christian and Matt uh, pitched to me, hey, we want to do music visualization. Uh, can't be that hard, right? Um, but then I asked, like, okay, um, how should we do that? And I said, well, we don't know, but we can try. So we said, okay, we want to do that in one semester, not full time, just part time. So um, we will not set up a specific goal where we want to head. We just said, okay, what we can do in that time we have um, and do a kind of research and development. And But how do you do that like from a production perspective? Well, in the first, you do kind of a swag scheduling. Um, which I said as a stupid wild ass guess. So you just think, okay, those parts parts of, of the engine and of all the assets, um, we just make a, a giant map what, what we can possibly do and split them up into bigger chunks, like one week items, and just go with our gut feeling for that. And of course, everything takes way longer than you expect. So multiply that by a relative risk. So um, you set up milestones, um, but not as specific assets you want to achieve. It's more that you say, okay, on this part um, in, the, in the schedule, we want to take this decision. So if something for engine-wise turns out to be working, then it's good. If not, we skip it or we choose another one. And then setting up sprints for that. Um, but um, to set up a sprint for always a new version, which allows the team to collect the maximum of amounts of validated learning with the least effort. So maybe the simplest solution is the best. And of course, always have and um, maintain the backlog of all the features you maybe still want to bring in. So uh, also what helps after you make uh, like your strength and weaknesses analysis to, to change your weaknesses into advantages. So uh, to, if, if you want to do something which is sh should be adaptable and readable and economically wise, just put a low poly art style, reuse whatever you have from other projects. For example, Christian worked on another pattern engine before, so we can use that for, for our city generation. And if you're just two people in the main team working on it, okay, let's sit them together, work in Unity in the same project at the same time, which is of course not possible if you have more team members, and iterate always, but don't A-B test. So with every iteration, this costs just too much time. Um, really choose your battles, which you want to iterate on, and get feedback from outside um, as soon as possible. So, and with that, thank you. And we head over to uh, the next project. Thank you. Okay, hi, my name is Ricardo Saleh. I want to present you my project Lionhearted. That's a 360 documentary, which I shot in Athens last year in September. And um, I'm going to begin with um, a short trailer from my project. And afterwards, I'm going to give you a short, like a, a bit of the background.
पानी था ना वो बहुत गहरा था उसमें जो भी डूब गया था सब लोग वो फिर वाटर वॉज वेरी डीप इफ सम ड्राउन दे नेवर केम बैक those who could swim could swim others didn't when we first climbed the mountains i thought we would hike there and go back but that never happened we kept walking and walking I'm currently moving um the video with the mouse I have here on the table. I was walking in front. There were mountains. I didn't have the courage to climb the mountains. But I did. So this is just a short um impression for you to get. Um how do I get this to the other um screen? Um the whole film is 13 minutes long and you can also see it at the FMX. Um we have a booth on the first um floor next to the stage if you get up the stage the main entrance on the left next of the animation institute. Um I started the project with a big research phase. Um I went to the Sheffield Festival which is a big festival in the UK and and checked out the 360 content and VR documentaries. Um at the Film Academy we had at that time the opportunity to use a camera like that camera like a, a special 360 camera and I also on, on in the team we participated at hackathons. and went to the VR community in Stuttgart here's a VR community which is meeting up every two months and we also did testing and prototyping with GoPro X most of my team um we come from film so all of us we did film projects um and we had to find a language for us to communicate because VR we had to learn VR as a different totally different new medium we couldn't just impose our thoughts and languages and ideas which we knew from filmmaking on to 360 filmmaking so there was like a phase of confusion and a phase of a lot of talks and checking out together in a team films on the Oculus on um the Samsung Gear discussions and to find out what we actually want to tell and how we want to describe our feelings in 360 and as we were doing a documentary we had to react to reality we couldn't just plan everything in advance So there was a lot of theory but we knew we just have to react to what actually will happen in Athens. This is a photo from the shooting. As you can see, we shot the film with a GoPro rig. We had 10 GoPros here on the um here on the top of my head. And uh, seven GoPros um were on one level and then one GoPro was looking up and two down. and this is a scene from the film um Weeda that's the main character and um these are the the camera student and the sound student and we also did a 3D binaural audio sound recording the shooting in Athens took 5 days and i was in Athens 4 weeks earlier for the research um which meant that i was looking for a protagonist i was talking with a lot of different ngos i went to a refugee camp and i was researching and finding out where would be the best place to shoot the film which would be the best story and throughout the shooting i had to learn that is um actually quite difficult to shoot and direct a child um one has less time and there's like less concentration and duration although Rita she's a very resourceful child like she's 8 years old and she had a lot of energy and so it was a great to work with her but still we had to cope with her schedule and 
um, it was different than if we would have had a, no, an adult. Um, then the post-production in Ludwigsburg started last October, and we have we had different phases of the post-production. We started with a rough stitch, which meant that we stitched all the different cameras together, and um, just like very quick and dirty. And then we looked at them and they did editing and decided which scenes would be in the film. We did a f testing, like we had a different edit versions and we tested them and got feedback. And then we got to the stage where we had a final edit. So we was like, okay, this is the picture lock. These are the scenes we actually want to have in the film, which meant we had to fine stitch them. So we went, um, we worked with, we worked mostly with Nuke and Car we are. We also worked with Autopano Video and Autopano Giga and um, also Photoshop and After Effects somehow. And so the fine stitch was actually quite a difficult um, process, took a lot of time. Then we went, finally we went in the grading, which we used Scratch VR and um, then the sound design and 3D mix and different exportings. Because for the Oculus you have to do a different export than Samsung Gear, YouTube. We actually just done that process. Um, the testing, for the testing, over 30, 30 participants participated, and we had six testing rounds. Um, I had specific questionnaires and interviews, and um, we really tried to find out what the majority of people would realize, because 360 of VR is a very personal experience. Everyone is going to look in a different direction. You don't really know where the people are looking at, um, but still we we wanted to know how much actually we could get across, how much would they still remember after watching the film. So um, this was very important and I can highly recommend if any of you are doing 360 of VR um, that to plan out some time for testing, it's definitely helpful. Um, yeah, um, actually, if I wanted to talk about the car dramaturgy, but I don't want to spoil all the film, but now it's in the presentation anyway. So. Um, Basically, the, the film is working with the with the voiceover. This is the, like the the rote Linie, like in German, um, which is telling the story. It's an interview. And, um, we worked with we worked mostly with Nuke and Car. We are. We also worked with Autopano Video and Autopano Giga, and um, also Photoshop and After Effects somehow. And so the fine stitch was actually quite a difficult um, process. Took a lot of time. Then we went, finally we went in the grading, which we used Scratch VR, and um, then the sound design and 3D mix, and different exportings. Because for the Oculus, you have to do a different export than Samsung Gear, YouTube. We actually just done that process. Um, the testing, for the testing, over 30, 30 participants participated. And we had six testing rounds. Um, I had specific questionnaires and interviews, and um, we really tried to find out what the majority of people would realize, because 360 of VR is a very personal experience. Everyone is going to look in a different direction. You don't really know where the people are looking at. Um, but still, we, we wanted to know how much actually we could get across, how much would they still remember after watching the film. So. Um, this was very important, and I can highly recommend if any of you are doing 360 of VR um, that to plan out some time for testing. It's definitely helpful. Um, yeah, um, actually, if I wanted to talk about the car dramaturgy, but I don't want to spoil all the film, but now it's in the presentation anyway. So um, basically, the, the film is working with the with the voiceover. This is the, like the the rote Linie, like in German, um, which is telling the story. It's an interview I made with Rita, and it's mostly based on her life at Holder City Plaza. So this um, hotel in Athens, Greece, which is self-organized, where refugees live, they um, occupied their place, and it's now run by refugees themselves. And basically, we just telling about her experiences of the escape and the past, like the Mediterranean Sea, the Taliban in Pakistan arriving at the camp in Greece. And um, also the films gives like an atmosphere of the Holder City Plaza. And I thought that for 360, I really wanted to give the people the chance to be and experience the hotel. Um, one of the like one of the learnings I did was 
um, obviously uh, not only for me but all the whole team like technical skills, stitching, compositing, understanding of different stitching tools, then 360 degree storytelling skills and the VR user testing. Then um, we like pipeline rendering user testing and render farm was very, very important for us. All the projects I did before, we were not that reliable, like the render farm or render time wasn't that important for us, but this time it took so much time, so we really had to talk about it, calculate it, and if there were problems, we had to fix them as soon as possible. And um, yeah, just finally, um, how do you find us on the internet? Like here at the FMX, I already said, you can go to our booth, you are warmly welcomed. You find us on the internet, we have a blog, lionhearted360.weebly.com, and you can check out um, our amazing trailer on YouTube if you just type in lionhearted360s. We also have a hashtag, I am lionhearted. So if you um, like the trailer, feel free to post the hashtag. And if there are not any questions, are there any questions? If not, I would give to the next person, to Katie. Thank you for your attention. Okay, um, hi, my name is Katie. I am a game artist student at Film Academy. And um, this semester, me and uh, a little team did a game called uh, The Blues. And the blues is an interactive experience about panic disorder and agoraphobia. So, <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to give you an impression of what the game looks like and uh, tell you a little bit about the progression. So, um, the, uh, the blues is, like I said, about panic disorder and agoraphobia, which is something that I struggled with for a year, two years ago, and I wanted to um, do a game about it or make it interactive. So, we started with scribbles. <laughs> with uh, scribbles and a game concept. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna do it with a arrow. Yeah, which we start with some scribbles and a game concept, a big uh, game design Bible and everything. And um, in the end, the game is about 15, 15 minutes long. You can play it for uh, 15 minutes for someone who uh, is uh, who has played it once before? He can he will take ten minutes about. And um, yeah, in this game you play a girl who is uh, at home and she hasn't left home for uh, a lot of weeks, and your goal is to get out of this apartment. And um, all you have to do is basically just everyday mundane stuff like making yourself a coffee or uh, brushing your teeth and every time uh, you do that you get interrupted by a panic attack. So during a panic attack your view is being scaled down like, uh, like this picture and you can hear her breathing and when she breathes you have to control her breathing with the left and the right trigger and if you do it in the right rhythm, your viewport, your viewport gets normal again. And also the blurry vision disappears. Um, and um, the, the game is settled in one room, but this room is constantly uh, changing. So it's hard to get to the door. But um, eventually, if you make it, you find yourself in the big city plaza and um, yeah, you, you're basically fighting your fear of going outside and uh, being at open places. So um, I just wanted to encourage you to come at our booth. It's right uh, next to the stairs first floor uh, on the left side and maybe just uh, try it out and play a little. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, I need two players for this. Is someone coming here? Just two person. Come on, stand up, stand up. I need pigeons. I presented you my project, it's Pigeon VR. I haven't got a fancy presentation, I'm just going to talk a lot. Um, and it's a game where you're a pigeon in VR. It's a multiplayer game for VR on smartphone. Uh, you may try, but it's not so terrible also if you don't see so much. I mean, the resolution is actually bad at f on the phones. Uh, you can try also with it's the same. I mean, they are small enough. Um, in the game, you are a pigeon, and uh, the only way you can move around is just by banging your hand, like a, uh, your head, like a pigeon does when he walks. So you are like doing like this. You walk like this. You get the bread like this on the floor, and uh, yeah, that way, the one who gets more bread wins the game. It's a pretty simple concept. I would talk more about it. Now I'll just start the game. So give me one minute and then you will see how it looks like. You don't see how the game looks like, and you see how the player looks like, which is the most interesting part. 